All right, welcome to another micro seminar, and we are very excited that this is our first international foray. So we have Yana Eglet from the Dalhousie University in Halifax, Canada, who actually tells us it's actually warm in summer there right now, so they're enjoying some nice temperatures. Uh, and today she's going to be telling us about protist fishing in microhabitats and the meaning of life. And so I think she'll end with some uh, future directions and tell us where she's going. So Yana, if you want to take it away. Great. Thank you very much, Jen. Um, oh, just to wait, interrupt one second. Remember, there's questions via Twitter or in Google Chat. And so through Twitter, if you want to do it to micro seminar or use the hashtag useseminar, we'll be able to see them. All right, thank you. Just a very quick warning is that I had just recently an incident involving a cat, a bottle of beer, and a keyboard. So if things get really weird, that's probably because my keyboard's not functioning. Um, yes. Anyway, so today I'm going to talk about the various protists um, found in microhabitats around us. And in a sense, I would like to upgrade them the micro seminar from 16s to 18s, i.e., to uh, bacterial uh, from bacterial to eukaryotic microbes, um, and they're often forgotten, in, it seems, in the microbiology circles. But there's also eukaryotic friends there, um, and oh, I'm sorry. So, and another thing is that this is going to be a little bit opposite of a research talk, in that I'm mostly going to be talking about various scraps scraps of unpublished observations and things I've done with the microscope while procrastinating rather than my actual main research projects. But I will finish up with, the, with my current project um, and briefly talk about that. Okay, so, next slide. Um, Um, so if we look at the diversity of eukaryotes, uh, or sorry, yeah, of eukaryotes, and here in the bottom we have some bacteria lying around, shifted to the side. Um, you, it's mostly a morass of things we wouldn't actually recognize on the microbial scale that we're used to. So there's a little bit of animals, of fungi, and plants um, interspersed with a whole bunch of, sorry, of um, among protists, which are the rest of eukaryotes. So I just have here indicated that animals, plants, and fungi um, with, um, in red, and all the other eukaryotes are what most of us define as protists. And yes, this includes uh, macroscopic algae like seaweeds and things like that. So it's all the rest. Um, and this is a simplified uh, version of the tree that I'm going to be using a bit later. So here's animals, fungi, and plants. Um, so we'll start off with fairly normal habitats, you would think. Um, so things like ponds and even just uh, the ocean shore, those kinds of environments. Um, and mainly the point here I'm trying to make is that um, to get us to think about not just in terms of, you know, there's a pond, there's a coast, there's an ocean, but rather the finer scale of the habitats, so, you know, the edge of the pond that is full of leaf litter, that is acidic um, and has a completely different environment than the middle of the pond or the planktonic layer in the top, and the further that you examine this, so if you start looking at, you know, something that's between leaves as opposed to on surface of leaves inside that pond, you get very different microbial compositions. And, of course, those of you who work with bacterial um, side of things, it's particularly pronounced there, and it's even hard to fathom and quantify, but here it's, with protists, at least you can convey it a little bit visually. Um, so here it's just uh, from a pond, there's a cyanobacterial filament next to a, um, a green algal filament. And I kind of like this image because you basically have, a, sorry, a cyanobacterium parallel to its cousin that went inside a eukaryotic, into the, inside a eukaryotic cell, you know, a billion, two billion years ago, and has now become what we know as plastids, as chloroplasts. So they kind of meet again. So ponds, for example, are probably they're about the earliest uh, studied microbial habitats. So known to us since uh, Van Leeuwenhoek's time, so the the father of microbiology, as people call him. So here is an actual illustration from his 1702 
um, uh, letter to philosophical transactions. Um, and there's a bunch of rotifers, but here you can see things that are actually we now know are paratrexiliates. Um, and they're among the earliest microbial life, single celled life described. Actually, I think this might be the first one. Um, and these were growing on duckweed, duckweed roots, so the little tiny green plants that hang around on the surface of ponds on their roots has already been observed 300 years ago in the entire ecosystem. And here's just a more modern image of um, an organism similar to what he saw. So um, the kind of, and here's kind of a forest of these paratrexiliates. So one of the themes here is that I think there's still plenty of work you can do um, in what we can call classical biology um, and small science, if you will, using modern tools and modern techniques. Um, there's many of things that we can still revisit and still find new, uh, new and interesting organisms and new facts of biology. So that's partly the meaning of life thing. Um, and also I would like you to just maybe, again, in line with the small science thing, um, I think there's lots of small projects that could be very interesting and very doable on a small budget of just undergraduates or even amateur um, scientists, you know, in the general public, um, who have the time to do this exploration that we, you know, later on and higher up in the career have less and less time to do. So these are just a few more of the more familiar organisms. Here's a, another ciliate, um, an alga, and an amoeba. So it's the kind of life we're familiar with. And the, pond, the ponds in particular are quite filled with them. Um, however, in the ponds you can also find life that's a lot less familiar, like this microgromia, which was found on, um, so if you float cover slips on, on a jar of pond water, you can often get things growing on it, so things that are normally benthic and hard to pick up. You can actually have them growing on your, uh, sorry, on, on your slide. And this is one of these organisms, and it mostly eats bacteria, although I have seen it cannibalize other similar amoebae that uh, grow on glass. And it's living in a little test, and these are its feet that it uses to eat things. Um, and even from some rather horribly boring environments, you can find interesting and even new stuff. So one time, returning from a science online conference in North Carolina in Raleigh, I realized right as I was about to go to the airport that I didn't get any samples. And I have kind of a tradition of trying to get a sample each time I go visit somewhere. Um, and, sorry. Um, and because I didn't have time to sample, I just swung by a storm drain, um, like a concrete storm drain, right out behind my friend's apartment. This is not good. Sorry, this is my keyboard acting up and messing. Um, hold on one second. Sorry about that. Um, and in this rather boring sample where there's a bunch of leaves just sitting in a puddle, um, there was this, um, this regular paramecium ciliate that was a little bit awkward to take pictures of. There was something odd about its cytoplasm where I wasn't able to get a good image of it. And it was just there was something weird about it. So I squashed one of the cells, and it turned out that it was absolutely full of these giant bacterial symbionts. So you can see these rods here. This is the squashed cell. This is the cytoplasm. Um, and they seem to be living in that you can see them in various stages of division. And usually the prey bacteria are inside little vacuoles where they're digested. So anyway, I have since cultured this line, and there's a few collaborators who work on bacterial and the symbionts of ciliates who have this line and are working with it. And it was isolated from a horribly boring suburban habitat that you wouldn't really think of finding anything cool in. Um, and even in ponds you can find complete unknowns. So I actually have no idea what any of these are. And 
people I've consulted with in the field also don't know what these are. Um, and I know that this guy has been seen one other time by an amateur uh, microscopist in Uruguay, of all places. So it's kind of it, it's it's nice to have a confirmation that it is actually a real organism and not just a fluke. Um, but unfortunately, they've only been seen once. I have no culture, and for the moment, can't really find out what they are. So it's tempting to think that um, categorizing these obscure odds and ends um, is kind of you know, an exercise for a taxonomist that, that nobody else should really care that much about it because, I mean, we've lived for thousands of years without knowing what these things are, so probably our lives won't get any better if we know about them now, we would think. But it turns out that they can actually yield some interesting answers, interesting facts to contribute to major evolutionary questions. So, for example, this little organism was not actually placed um, in any particular part of the tree uh, until um, a few years ago, I think three or four years ago. So it's very recently it became a non-orphan lineage. And, and before it was found, um, it was thought that integrins were evolved um, because they were not known in fungi or in any other carrier, the integrin complex that's uh, surface, it's used for signaling and for adhesion, um, that it's a Thing that's specific to animals and the lineage leaving, leading to animals, so the holozoans uh, that evolved around here where my cursor is right now. But this was actually kind of an unusual organism in that it was one of the earlier critters to be described and categorized phylogenetically with a transcriptome in the description, basically. So this is now with the new era of sequencing. You can get a transcriptome before you even name an organism. Um, and I'll get, again, get back to that later at the end of the talk. Um, but it turned out that it actually has integrin complexes, and it's outside of lineage uh, leading to fungi. So it suggests that actually the ancestors of fungi had, uh, the ancestors of the lineages leading to fungi had integrins, and that it's not an animal specific complex by any means. Um, but it's just curious to see what other um, such questions we can answer through finding more lineages that have that contain surprises, you know, that um, either presence or even absence of certain complexes that we expect. Um, moving on to the slightly more strange, um, like us to think about epibionts, kind of in the microbial jungle of things living on things. So these aren't protists, um, these are rotifers in a hydrozoan, but it's kind of curious because these uh, rotifers were alive despite living in these uh, tentacles. Um, I couldn't find, I'm sorry, um, I couldn't find any, um, anything in the literature, my admittedly short search, um, on symbiotic rotifers of hydroids, but apparently that might be actually a thing, and I've seen this several times. Um, but that aside, here in the corner there is actually produce, so it's a dividing cilia that was evidently stunned. Um, and I have once observed a cilia that actually had an emetocyst from the uh, from the Nigerian sticking out of it, and it was paralyzed. Usually when protists die, they blow up. They don't just sit there in a paralyzed phase. So that's kind of interesting. but. Once again, I couldn't find anything in the literature on the intracellular activity of nematocysts. Everything is focused on you know, tissue level um, effects, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, of course, things that live inside of things, the various gut commensals and mutualists and parasites, there's, I mean, that's kind of a given that there's a whole zoo inside of every animal, um, in different zoos in different parts of animals. But it's also curious, so that's a Gregory. Um, it's a relative of things like malaria. It's an apicomplexin, but it's thought to be a commensal, and this one just hangs out in a tunicate gut and presumably nibbles a little bit on what the tunicate eats. Um, so when I was at a marine biology station at Friday Harbor on the Pacific Coast, um, I kept a tank full of distractions, and there's all these invertebrates living in there. And one of the critters is this adorable kelp isophon, and they're really cute and fun. Um, but after a while, I became curious to see what was not inside. I didn't kill it, um, but what was what would be living on the gill 
the gills, the uh, gill filaments that arthropods have, um, a part of the legs. Um, so, sorry. Okay. Um, so I looked at one of those um, filaments. Sorry about this, guys. This is incredibly infuriating. I think we lost your screen share. Yeah, I'm trying to get it back. Sorry. Yeah, basically the keyboard spazzes and treats them as keyboard shortcuts and weird stuff happens. Anyway, um, so looking into the, the gill rakes underneath the tail of the uh, tail region of the isopod, um, you can see um, here's the part of the actual of the segment of the leg. Here are presumably also extensions of that leg, um, the gill rake. And here's something that looks a little bit more bacterial growing on it. Although I'm actually still at the moment not entirely convinced they're bacteria, but they might be. But there were some more convincing um, bacterial structures. So you can see long filaments all over the place. So basically there's a jungle living among this uh, the comb-like structure in the arthropod. And suddenly, in this jungle, and the longer filaments are definitely, there were cyanobacteria in there, by the way, so and they seem to be very specifically attached to these uh, structures, so there's probably some sort of very specific uh, symbiosis going on there. Um, but here is a little ciliate. Um, um, and these are actually a group of ciliates that are very rarely known, almost never seen, because the, this entire group specializes specifically on uh, living in things like gill rakes and, yeah, in various arthropods. So they actually, this is their kind of habitat, and very few people really look at them. Or very few ciliatologists pick up invertebrates and stare at them, just because there's not very many working on ciliates in the first place. Um, so and is kind of a neat organism to look at. Um, it's called a trixiliate. And what's kind of curious about this group, actually, is that this little thing, it's a baby ciliate. Um, so some of these cells, uh, they divide endogenously, as opposed to, um, you know, as, as you classically think of uh, binary fission of two equal cells. Here you actually do have a mother and a daughter cell, and that's not unique in the eukaryotic kingdom. There's plenty of other groups that do this too, but it's still kind of neat. It's almost like the ciliate is pregnant. Um, so here is um, going, continuing on with the topic of this jungle of microbes, things growing on things. Um, Um, you have, so off the docks at the field station, they had these little ropes uh, hanging off, and they were, they were left there, and the dock floats, so there's no tidal action. And you have this whole jungle of stuff growing on it, so you have all sorts of large seaweeds, and then smaller seaweeds on the large seaweeds, and sponges, and um, um, sponges and all sorts of invertebrates growing in there, and it's this whole fractal of microhabitats upon microhabitats. Um, so imagine now you have this red alga, something like this, but a little bit bigger actually, so it's a little clunky for taking pictures of the microscope. And on it, I at one point found these uh, very spiky glass balls on sticks. Um, they have these spines, and they have glass scales inside of them, and they're absolutely full of silica. And they're pretty large for a, for a single cell thing. They're about um, two, two, three millimeters long sometimes, the stalk, and the head is about 100 microns, so it's, it can be quite big but for our scale. Um, and so here you see these are little glass elements, and it's just, it's full of glass. And in fact, it turns out that it was first described as a sponge because it was so full of glass. And uh, Merzkowski later actually issued an, amend an amendment that, oh, actually, I looked at this closer, and this was a single-celled organism, and it's not a sponge. 
And I read some of that that actually prompted his interest in, um, in, in microbes and single cell materials, which later led to his development of the theory of, uh, of symbiosis, um, namely pl plastid symbiosis in his case. So it's, you can kind of make a very tenuous claim that this, indirect, this organism indirectly led to the theory of symbiosis. Um, so I went back to that place later um, and attempt to find it again. Is it? Okay. Cats and keyboards don't mix. Sorry, is it spazzing for you guys as well right now? Or is it just my screen? No, it's spazzing. Okay. What? I'm really sorry about this. Okay. Here's Jeff, calm down. All right, so the idea was to go back there and look for these organisms again to... And to look for these organisms in order to um, get a transcriptome. Um, single, so there are now techniques to do single cell transcriptomics um, to get some images of it, figure out what the nucleus is, and, or, and then at the very least do a whole genome amplification to get a small subunit to at least get some molecular data for this organism. And I forgot to mention that this bug was actually basically not looked at or touched since the end of the 19th century. Um, I mean, it's still there. It's not excruciatingly rare, presumably, but people have just not thought about it. Um, so the idea of very simply staining it and with Daphne and looking for the nucleus turned out to be a little more complicated because I was hoping that because it's such a huge organism, it'll have a nice big nucleus and we could figure out whether it's in the head or the stalk because there's a little bit of conflicting data on that. Um, but it turned out that actually it seems like this, it's hard to tell here, but um, it seems like it has very few nuclei and they're small. Or the material that most closely, that was the closest candidate to being a nucleus. Um, sorry, okay, I'm going to try to do this differently. Can you guys still see all right if I just present it without the full screen mode? That would be fine. Can you like maybe enlarge the screen a little and get rid of the left hand side? Oh yeah, I can do that. Yes. Thank you. That's a yeah. good idea. Oh, that's better. Right. Excellent. So again, sorry about that, guys. Um, all right. So and here's another DIC image, and this is the closest candidate I could find to a nucleus, and I'm still not very sure about what's. <laughs> All right, um, so that's the closest thing to the uh, nucleus that I could find. Um, and, wow, this is a disaster. All right, unfortunately, um, so the transcriptome was out of question because the organism was completely full of symbionts of both bacterial kind and of uh, algal symbionts inside of it, so it would not have been possible to sort out this many contaminants in, in an organism. And unfortunately for the whole genome amplification that was supposed to be this very simple procedure, and it usually works at least enough for me, you know, at least if I try enough cells, nothing worked. So the whole three-day uh, experiment didn't quite work, which is a cautionary tale. I think that time is useful for these things. Um, again, ignore my keyboard spazzing. Moving on to the extreme environments now. Um, a little more extreme than jungles of things growing on things. Um, so these are salt crystals. And I guess well, these are now getting in the way. Not fun. Um, um, so, right, so 
these are salt crystals and this is medium that is so salty, so saline, that actually as you look at it with the microscope, you see crystals just growing. Um, and despite, so this is at about, um, it's over 300 parts per thousand, it's almost over 30% salt. Um, it's at, right at the saturation point. And you would think that nothing should really grow in that because it's kind of an absurd habitat. Maybe a few Archaeans because that's their thing. But it turns out that actually there's quite a few um, eukaryotes who can handle even, so not all of these can go to the fully saturated salt, but there are actual eukaryotes living in what is essentially 320 parts per thousand salt. You know, ten times saltier than the than regular seawater. And actually most of them, these weird habitats tend to be dominated by um, these amoebae called heterolobosians. They're or they're actually not related at all to the classical amoeba proteus kind of thing. So there's a lot of them. And they also have flagellated forms. And they tend to like hot environments as well. Um, there's some ciliates, um, some weird flagellate I actually found and have in some sort of crude culture that we don't know what it is. And a bunch of small um, things called stramina piles that are generally everywhere anyway. Um, so this ciliate is actually quite interesting in that it also happens to be an anaerobe. So it's a halophile, extreme halophile, and an anaerobe. Uh, so talk about combining weird environments uh, in a difficult life. So, and inside of it, it actually has symbionts, interestingly. So here you have um, methanogens that are surrounded by these little structures that are um, reduced mitochondria called hydrogenosomes, and they produce hydrogen gas. And hydrogen gas is not a very common thing in the natural environment to just be ran to be able to find it. So bacteria that feed off of hydrogen gas that use it are actually under a lot of pressure to seek out sources and utilize them. So a lot of protists with hydrogenosomes also have um, bacterial and archaeal symbionts who take advantage of this weird metabolism. So here you have the bacteria and they're surrounded by the hydrogenosomes that are feeding off of it. Um, and just as a caveat, this is the same genus but a different species, um, just so we know. Which brings us now to anaerobes, which is what I'm currently working on um, mostly, although touch on, we touch on halophiles as well. So this is actually not something from the fridge. Um, this is uh, sediment that was mixed, that was full of um, seaweeds, again from the site in the, in the Pacific coast, and you just let it sit for a couple of days and it turns into this. So it's just full of sulfur bacteria and all sorts of other bacteria that I don't even want to begin to think about because that's a, an extremely complex environment and it differs in each case and it's it's just a fascinating world. But it's also full of very interesting eukaryotes that also really like low oxygen environments, and in fact, some of which absolutely can't stand oxygen. So, and just for a more natural setting, this is the kind of habitat where you can find these anoxic muds. Um, and by the way, sampling, so this is a, a bay that at high tide, it's a, it looks like a bay, but at low tide, almost the whole thing becomes exposed. So it's a very shallow water. That's probably why it's called false bay. Disappointed a few uh, seafarers back in the day. Um, but these environments are amazing for microbiologists. There's parts of it that have mats. And the point is actually that each of the different regions within this bay has a slightly has a different habitat. And you can often find different organisms just a few meters apart. So it's very interesting to look at. And this was also the source for an organism I will talk about very shortly. Um, so this is again going back to our eukaryotic tree. Uh, it used to once be thought that anaerobes were kind of the ancestral state for eukaryotes, and then later they acquired a mitochondrion and you know, or gradually developed the mitochondrion. This, these were theories a long time ago. Um, so it just seemed natural that you know. We, we like to think that weird things reflect the, the very ancient organisms we're like, as opposed to them being more recently derived. So it's just kind of a bias. We had the same thing with Archaeans, right? 
Um, but it turns out that actually anaerobicity evolved many, many times independently throughout the eukaryotic tree. So with the red stars are where you have um, the where you have groups that contain anaerobes that are actually not anaerobic groups inherently. And in the red letters are groups that are uh, entirely anaerobic. So there's one of them right here in the metamonas that's particularly famous for it. So they have things like Giardia, the agent of beaver fever, Trichomonas vaginalis, um, which is an STD, and uh, things called Parabacelids and Oxymonads that live in the termite guts and also guts of some wood-eating cockroaches and help digest wood. So that's kind of a famous group of uh, anaerobes. And then there's a few other things, some of which have only been recently characterized as to where they go. Um, Blastocystis, for example, is an opportunistic human pathogen. So an immunocompromised people you can get, and you can act, it can actually become a, a, patho a pathogenic condition. You can get sick from it. Um, but it looks like a yeast. It was thought to be a yeast. It's this round. It actually has even less morphological detail than a, ye than a yeast. It's kind of impressively boring it, as far as morphology goes. And it turns out to be a stromenopile among all mice eats and brown algae and things like that. Like it's not a very expected position for it. Um, so, hang on. Yes. So again, going back to our uh, anaerobic halophilic ciliate example, um, you get a whole continuum of mitochondrial reduction. So at the one end, you have the canonical mitochondria, you know, textbook Christi and all the rest. On the very complete opposite end of the scale, you have, you have these things called mitosomes, which are basically vesicles with very few metabolic functions of the mitochondria remaining. And they, some of them actually import ATP, so it's, you would think that, you know, we're, we're so trained to think of mitochondria as producing ATP, and that's their main function, but it actually turns out that ATP production can go very easily. It's some of the other functions, like iron sulfur cluster uh, production, that is indispensable in most, almost all cases indispensable um, among eukaryotic mitochondria. Um, and again, the whole the distribution, these different stars, they have, some of them are hydrogenosomes, so they produce hydrogen gas, some of them are mitosomes, completely reduced. At the moment, one of the most reduced mitochondria is known, uh, that's published is in the Rice area. And actually, both of these only very recently were found to have home here. Um, so I think five years ago, no one would have said that Rizarians had this supergroup had anaerobes in it. Um, so a lot of this is completely new. This part of the tree is also completely new in the last five years. Um, so, so that said, despite quite a few people actually working on eukaryotic anaerobes, there's quite a few new things that you can just find just by looking. And basically, most of what I do is I take samples, I throw some of the sample into media, I let it rot for a few days, and then I look at what's in there. And if I like what's in there, I try to propagate it further until I get rid of all the contaminants, and then you get a culture. Um, so that's these are these five critters are what I have found, and one of I will talk about this one for very shortly. Um, but the rest, actually, all of these were found in the last uh, three four months. Um, and they're in various stages of being cultured. And I mean, any of them can go missing at any moment for some reason that would be obvious in hindsight 20 years later and somebody knows more about their biology. Um, so it's a little bit of a risky gamble sometimes. But what's interesting about these is that we actually, um, a couple of them are completely new. So uh, this one and this one um, and this, sorry, and this one, these are actually, these three are not described at all. These two are described, but nobody knows where they go, and very little is known about them. Um, and they're quite strange. So they're all anaerobes. Again, they blow up if you add the same kind of medium, but fresh, so oxygenated, they hate you. Um, just, to, just for fun, this bug was, for some reason, named Barthamona. And oddly enough, it just so happens that it comes from a sample I got from Catalonia. So, you know, 
place where Barcelona, where Barcelona is and how it would be pronounced in Spanish. It's a complete coincidence, but it's kind of amusing. Um, so I'm going to talk about this bug, actually, for the rest of the talk. Um, and it's the first one that I observed. I found it in, um, first on the Pacific coast and then again on the Atlantic coast when I was looking more specifically for it. So it's a little bit weird. Um, it has four equal flagella and a cruciform cross-like arrangement, um, which is, um, just trust me on this, it's strange. Um, there's only a couple other organisms known like that. Um, and one of them has only recently been placed. The other is not published. So it's a very mysterious group. Uh, non-groups, sorry, a very mysterious type of morphologies. And it just turns out that those three are completely unrelated to each other. Um, and there are some algae that have this arrangement, but these are very obviously nothing to do with algae. Um, so this is one organism. Um, it was mentioned once in a kind of a survey of things living in benthic muds. Um, it was named Protist X. Um, it was not described, it was just that was a working name for something they've observed. And luckily it has been found since and is now in culture. Um, so this right here is actually predation in progress. So here I have a time series um, of uh, a small flagellate, also an anaerobe. So this is all in anaerobic conditions. These guys blow up if you look at them for too long. Um, an anaerobe being gradually ingested and um, phagocytosed and and soon to be eaten um, by the very vicious predatory anaerobe, which I've, I've actually witnessed it once um, try to eat two cells at once, so they're pretty voracious predators, and that's probably why I could observe it feeding on them in the first place, because feeding is something that's hard to see on the side, in part because I think things are quite stressed from having a cover slip thrown on them, um, but because these guys are voracious predators, it was very easy to see. So it turns out that it eats two of the flagellates that we happen to have in culture. So these are both um, anaerobic eukaryotes. They're um, not actually related to each other too closely. Um, they're quite distant, even though they look similar. Um, so I have it growing on one of them. Um, and this allows to do fun things like EM. Um, so these are all preliminary. I have not yet gotten a very a nice fix at all. But just the just out of, to satisfy curiosity, a quick glimpse of the organism. This, um, this is one of the flagellar pockets. So you can see here the flagella come out of these little canals. Um, so you can see that there's a flagellum in the pocket. Um, you probably can't see because it actually took my supervisor to point it out to me. Um, there are little tiny hairs all over the cell surface. So it's a fluffy cell, actually. It's kind of cute. Um, there's these vacuoles. That, these contents, even though they look cool, sorry. Um, they're probably artifactual from fixation, so don't pay too much attention. Um, but it's a very evacuated cell. Um, but what's curious is that there's no obvious canonical mitochondria. Mitochondria tend to be a lot uh, more resistant to fixation artifacts than um, other eukaryotic cell parts, because they're basically bacteria inside a eukaryote, right? So usually, even in a really bad fix, you can kind of see them, but here in this Nothing. So, um, and these are single membrane bound vesicles, so they're probably not associated. Um, also, there were these peculiar little structures. So this is a really bad fix, but you could still see them. Um, these, uh, that are presumably extrusomes. So, a lot of protists have these structures they use for either hunting or defense, in this guy's case, probably hunting, um, that they fire, they secrete very rapidly some sort of substance or, you know, mechanically extrude depending on what the function is. So they're called extrusomes. Um, oh, and here is a nucleus, um, a, a probable Golgi apparatus. Um, so another closer look at these extrusomes. Um, they kind of dock um, with the base, uh, the dark base down and um, they look kind of cute. But importantly, they don't resemble closely anything that's currently known in, as, as far as eukaryotic extrusome. So often they're used to as kind of another, an extra diagnostic, a morphological diagnostic to determine the affinity of this organism. So this didn't actually help us figure out what it is. So, right, so 
based on surface morphology and basic looks of it, we have no idea what it is. Based on the internal structures, we still have no idea what it is. Um, meaning that you have to, um, so these are unusual. Um, so we have to go to molecular tools. So I got small subunit from it, the usual deal, 18S, um, then blasted it, the first, you know, hoping that it wasn't something obvious. Um, and the top hit was like 78% um, identity, so not. Um, and my small subunit trees, despite, you know, using like likelihood and all that, I was getting bootstrap values of about 8, sometimes 10 out of 100. So it became very obvious that even the most advanced phylogenetic technique with this one gene are not going to tell us anything. So we had to do a transcriptome. And I don't have the data included here because it's not yet refined and um, a collaborator working on it. But we, I'll show you where the results are with fairly good confidence. It turns out that it actually goes right here. So remember the metamonads that I mentioned earlier that have the uh, Giardia and Trichomonas and the classic uh, anaerobes. This critter, turns out, goes outside that whole group. So it's sister group to metamonads, or the basomost metamonad, depending on what we learn more about it and you know how it um, fits the definition of a metamonad. Um, but it's a very deep branching lineage, and it's kind of exciting. And furthermore, it's particularly exciting because it, tell, it can tell us something about the evolution of mitochondria, or um, diminishment thereof in the metamonad lineage. Because these guys, their ancestor had an, um, a mitochondria. We actually, I guess we don't know about this node, but now we've pushed it further. But it's something to work the, you know, the um, evolutionary story of the rest of the group against. So this is quite exciting. And we're currently uh, working on the mitochondrial genes and uh, seeing what's there, what's not. And um, there's some. Hopefully some cool results will come out of this. So this is just from fiddling around in the mud, looking at stuff, you know, small science kind of thing that gradually evolved into a big science question, you know, big question anyway, um, with, a transcript, with a transcriptome done for this organism before it's even described, but hopefully answering some evolutionary questions. So then, of course, there's the question of where the rest of these guys go that I'm working with. Um, so... That's still in progress, and who knows, maybe some of them will also go in surprising places in the tree and help fix it. So it's not just, you know, a question of boring taxonomy. It's actually a biologically relevant question that ties in with, I, the meaning of life was supposed to be kind of a way to describe the big biological questions. It's just not very, I couldn't find a very good way to summarize that, but that's kind of life to us, right, is these big uh, biological questions like mitochondrial evolu evolution. Also the, the phylogeny of the tree itself. So with better taxon sampling, you can place things in the tree with greater confidence. You can place orphan lineages in the tree and find out where they go. So in a sense, it's kind of, you know, it's fun. It's mucking around in mud and looking at cool new critters, but it also does tie in with bigger questions, um, which hopefully will tell us something interesting. Um, and also just wanted to point out that um, from the 5th to the 10th of September, we have a, our annual big international protostology meeting, um, and a bunch of us will be live tweeting that, so if you're bored in the middle of September, um, we can, hope you can stop by and check it out. Um, and of course, I couldn't do this work without the previous three places I've worked at in the last three, four years, just the various observations where they come from, but the bulk of the, the anaerobe work actually comes from Dalhousie, and especially I would like to thank my supervisor, Alistair Simpson, um, my committee member, Andrew Roger, and my collaborators here, um, and my previous boss at Friday Harbor on the Pacific Coast for allowing me to muck around in the mud for fun on the side, um, and also a lot of the microscopy was done um, a lot of on the pond stuff was done at um, Indiana University of Bloomington and funding and yeah. So I would be happy to take questions now. And again, sorry about the glitchy keyboard issues.
Thanks, Jonah. That was awesome. If anyone inside the Hangout wants to unmute themselves and uh, ask a question, please feel free to. And if you're watching through YouTube or on the Google Hangout, please tweet us questions and uh, use the hashtag seminar or send them to at microseminar. So as we're, um, as we're waiting for some questions to come in, I have actually a question for you, which I know we've talked a little bit about, right, is that mm -hmm. I, you know, we go explore anaerobic environments, and sometimes we find eukaryote lineages that if you check all established literature, the established literature says for sure this is an aerobe. <laughs> and so I love to cite things that say there's multiple origins of anaerobe. You know, and so like, where do you think on the tree is there a limit to eukaryotic anaerobes, or where are we going to see... How, how many times can I not say, right, that I found this strange sequence and it might actually be alive there? Um, well, first of all, to touch on that, um, I have this peculiar case of a classic an anaerobe growing with a classic aerobe in the same culture. Um, except, but, but the anaerobe is new. Actually, both of them, I don't actually know what they are yet, um, specifically. But the weird thing about the classic anaerobe is that moving it to an aerobic culture, it can actually survive. Like, it's not super happy, but it lives and it multiplies there, and you can keep it in culture. But the choanoflagellate drops off. Um, so it seems very indirect and very sketchy, admittedly, evidence um, that the choanoflagellate might, in fact, be an anaerobe. Um, and Again, that's not something people expect, but it could well be there. We see plenty of other lineages, like kinetoplastids, for example, are also supposed to be um, aerobes. We find them in very strictly anaerobic environments, so they're probably anaerobes as well. Um, it just, there's very few of us, so, <laughs> and a lot of them. So, yeah, no, um, in terms of limits, I don't, you know, we would think that algae probably should be pretty aerobic, but... There's that blastocystis example um, that I think there's actually parasitic green algae, so Helicosporidium, for example, and Prototheca. I don't think they're anaerobes. I'm not sure about that, but if they can become parasites, why not anaerobes too, right? So there might be not that much limit. <laughs> it's good to know. All right, anyone else have a question that wants to chime in? Feel free to unmute yourself. Um, have I unmuted myself? Yes, you have. Yes. Nice question. Oh, um, yeah. Has anyone looked at uh, tetranucleotide or hexanucleotide motif frequencies in protists um, for some of these organisms where the small ribosomal subunit doesn't provide you with the phylogenetic uh, support for a clear position? Could whole genome sequencing and just simply looking at the frequencies of you know, trinucleotide or tetranucleotide motifs give you some idea of a candidate position when you compare those frequencies to other protists? Probably could, and I think there are people doing that for, like, very deep phylogeny kind of stuff, but resolving the, the very base of the eukaryotic tree is actually still kind of a mess. Um, right. But for things like placing, you know, non-orphan lineages um, or... Um, usually by the time you get, well, by the time you get a genome, you have plenty of information to resolve mm -hmm. things, but the, the, people tend to do transcriptomes right now, in part because doing genome work is actually incredibly difficult when you don't have a, even a remotely close reference genome. Um, you have to have axenic culture, you can't have contaminants in there, it becomes this complicated mess, right? And then, who knows, it could be like a dinoflagellate full of junk and repeats everywhere, and good luck assembling that, right? Whereas, so it's not, it's not a question of assembly, it's just a question of getting the raw sequence data. Well, yeah, and I think it's a question of we're not really at that level yet with most of these organisms. Like, there's, if we had a lot of resources, then yeah, we would be sequencing genomes left, right, etc. Um, mm -hmm. But at the moment, the transcriptomes are much faster, much easier. And doing a multi-gene phylogeny with transcriptome data usually answers questions without having to go to tricky bioinformatics voodoo stuff Okay. Um, <laughs> for the moment. However, we do have like dedicated orphans who no matter what you do to them, you get, you know, their transcriptomes, anything. They still don't seem to go anywhere in particular on the tree where there's a com conflict of where they go. It's, we have some persistent ones like that too, so yeah. 
sorry, that was a long-winded, I guess, no to your question. <laughs> no, that that was that was helpful. Yeah, but the thing is, with, with looking at genome evolution um, stuff, you have to have a pretty good resolution of genomes to begin with. You can't really just grab one genome from a vast clade and just assume that it represents it, right? So right. People, we, we fall for that regularly, but um, <laughs> you have to be very careful in making these generalizations. So unless you have, you know, a handful of genomes in a group, you can't really even begin to say much about it. Okay. You should be cautious. Anyway. Awesome. Any other questions inside the Hangout? If not, I feel like the, the Twitter has gone a little bit quiet. And so uh, so with that, we can close. And thank you for delivering a fine micro seminar. And next week, next month, we will be uh, doing another symbiosis-based talk. Um, and so check in throughout the summer. And we will have a schedule running through January now. So thanks, everyone. Excellent.